So welcome back to the program. Uh, it's time for our conversation right now. I'm starting with one of my guests, Alabode Shomi, who is an energy consultant. He's the chief executive at Captree. He's also the vice chair, gas to power study group of Nigeria's Gas Association. Uh, SLA, a senior legislative assistant. Aid. Aid, senior legislative aid to the Senate president and consultant, House Committee on Gas. Welcome, uh, Mr. Shomumi, and thanks for joining us. We're still expecting our second guest, the Technical Sec Secretary, Host Communities of Nigeria, uh, Producing Oil and Gas, Host Com, High Chief George Buckner. Uh, when he comes, he'll join the conversation. Um, but it, let me start by asking you, as a consultant on these issues, were you in the hall when uh, the Kasala bust, the last <laughs> bust ensued? I was in the hall on that day, but I was not in the hall in that minute. When the when the incident happened, so I, I I have a fair feel of what happened, but I was not present. I was not an eyewitness, so to speak. Okay. Why do you think that this petroleum industry bill that has been I in in the works for a lot of time, for so long a time, years, perhaps if not even into the second decade now, if I'm not uh, mistaken, why do you think it's witnessed a, a stormy journey, such a stormy journey? I think primarily it's interest and understanding of uh, a balance of uh, ensuring that all interests are protected. At the time the petroleum industry bill came, uh, 12 years ago, it's a totally different bill from what we are experiencing now. So the IOCs at that time particularly felt that they were going to be shortchanged by the new set of laws. And on the basis of that, they resisted it, which means they lobbied all the interest and players and all that. Um, apparently at that time, maybe the host communities did not have the kind of voice they had now, and maybe they had, and, but whatever be the case, there was a lot of push and pull, which did not allow the bill to see the light of the day. The second part of it is that every legislative session actually ends in four years. And the law does not allow you to carry on the bill to the next legislative assembly. So every four years, the thing needs to start again. You know, like they got to the point of passage. Uh, the bill was passed and sent to the president in the last in the last dispensation. However, because of the laws that make the assembly, the bill needs to be started again. So technically, they have a four-year window to actually do it. Once it's not done within that window, they need to restart again. So that's another reason. And usually there are going to be new sets of people. They're going to ask largely the same questions, but because there are new sets of people, you need to go with the same old arguments, start from the sentiments, start from the beginning and all that. So basically, those are the issues why it has taken so long. Mm. If we take a look at the reintroductions and reintroductions for every uh, four years that you know the lawmakers come in, have we actually seen more of the same content or uh, the same content with different interests or different content with same interests? Well, let's look at it this way. There are principles which are the core building blocks and then there are the details. In terms of the principles, there has been largely nothing that has changed. I mean, the first thing is that they want a more transparent industry. They want a regulator, a one-stop shop for a regulator. You know, some of all those things, they've remained consistent over time. Now, in terms of the principles, in terms of who we'll get what percentage of these, in terms of who we'll get what acreage of these, in terms of who within the new system is going to have what powers, the limitations, some of all those details change. But what is important, what is primarily more important is that you're going to have an industry that is going to be properly structured. That's number one. The second thing is that you're going to have an industry that you can largely hold people responsible. And I give a very simple example, which I used to illustrate some of these key issues, is that today, if there's an electrocution, God forbid, there is a process that the NEC, Electricity Regulatory Commission, sets out for you, where there will be investigation, the families of the victims will be involved, the discourse will be involved. A report is going to come out at the end of it, over a certain period, and the National Assembly will be uh, presented with a copy of such report. So there's a process. People are going to be held accountable. Somebody will pay some fines and all that. Today, if there's a cylinder gas explosion in the home, and there's been a number of that, there's basically 
no process to follow, and really nobody to hold responsible. So some of all those things will end because there's going to be now be a proper regulator. There's going to be, I mean, a number of other issues. So the in more importantly, it's also going to make the industry clear so that those who want to invest will understand what they are investing investing for. So it's, I mean, it's, it's largely a lot in terms of principles, but the details, the mm. fine print. Ha, 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 have you been privy to some of the details of the present one lying before the National Assembly since yes. the president... Um, Presented, I think, uh, September 28th, last year? Yes. The uh, the document that was sent by the president, it's about a 115-page document, the bill, the holistic bill itself. They've made the uh, provisions for uh, two regulators. One is the authority, uh, which will cover uh, the, uh, the downstream part, and then they, there will be a second regulator. Now, to my mind, and this is largely my own opinion, is that the nation could actually work well with one regulator, primarily because at the end of the day, you are going to have some of the, some of the roles of the two regulators overlapping. One is handling downstream and midstream, one is handling upstream. They will come, and what that means at the end of the day is that you are going to increase cost of operations because it is the operator, the person that is on the field, that the time, I mean, that should be the bright, that should be the most important thing for development. But that's a totally different issue. However, in comparison to where we are now, from where we used to be, even if we have three regulators, it's fine. What is important is that we make progress, the industry is transparent, um, the regulatory functions do the things they need to do, and then there's progress for everybody. Do you think that um, perhaps why we've not seen the kind of progress that we're supposed to have seen over the years concerning the PIB is because personal and selfish interests supersede that of n national interests. Do you think so? Coming on all that's from all the stakeholders. I think that's a general Nigerian malice. <laughs> so you probably find that everywhere, whether it's in the health sector, whether it's in sports, whether it's in, I mean, in virtually every sector. And it's a thinking behind, <coughs> this is my time. So basically, where people are more concerned about person, where people are more concerned about self, the holistic suffers, and ultimately, even the initial self also suffers. So yes, you could say that personal interest has been part of the bane, even with some of the faults, some of the incidents that happened with the, on the floor, at the root of it, uh, unspoken personal interest. Because if you look at it, when you have two people from the same host community group fighting, you begin to ask what's the question? Because ultimately at this level, at the level of coming to the federal level, they have the same interest. They have the same interest of getting the, better, uh, the best deal possible for their host communities. It is possible they have diverse interests when they get home. But at this level, they have the same interest. So irrespective of whoever comes up, is largely going to represent your interest. But there will be personal issues, there will be unspoken desires, there will be unbridled, um, maybe even greed and all that. So at, at some point in time, you know, just like you were analyzing with the scriptures, you know, the, when you have big <laughs> and powerful people, like you had King David, everybody, every David needs a nut and a prophet that will tell him you are the man. That when you have looked at the the, the, the soldier that died and that killed somebody else and you're wondering where is he, let me kill him and all that. Because some of our problems, some of the incidences, some of the destruction, the lack of development that has happened, have some external factors to it, we cannot doubt that, has some failure of government. But sometimes you need a prophet that will actually tell us in the communities that are the The question man. is... Where will the prophet come from? Perhaps you will answer that question when we come from the break. Or who will the prophet be? Or who will take the mantle of the prophet, just like Elisha took the mantle when Elijah left? All right, <laughs> we're not going biblical, uh, but when we come back from the break, we'll continue the discussion on petroleum uh, industry bill. Please join us on all our social media handles. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching our video. Please hit the subscribe button below, turn on post notification, to follow all our updates. All right, welcome back uh, to the program. Uh, in case you're just joining us, we, we are continuing our discussion 
Uh, Labio De Shomi, an energy consultant, is uh, still here with me. He is the senior legislative aide to the Senate President and consultant House Committee on Gas. We're looking at the petroleum industry bill. Just before the break, we were talking about what the profits will be. And I'm asking that question in contest because we've seen the journey that the PIB has taken, at least since for many years now. I remember during uh, the former, I think it was former Minister of Petroleum, um, I think it's passed now, uh, Minister uh, Lukman. Rewan Lukman. Yes, Lukman. yes uh, uh, Minister Lukman Rewan, or Real One Lukman, Lukman. You know, came up with a report as at that time. I think that report formed the basis for which um, President Jonathan at that time, from Yarado's administration, President Jonathan went to the, either the Seventh Assembly or so, as at that time. So, who, who will the prophet be, or who is the prophet, or who will take the mantle? Because it seems that this journey, that is one bill that, what is the most popular bill on the lips of many Nigerians? Well, it ought to be. I mean, because most of our forex comes from, um, comes from oil and oil-related activities. Most of our income, as of today, comes from oil and oil-related activities. So anything that will make that increase, anything that will make that transparent, anything that will make that work better, will invariably concern and affect a lot of people among the people that we relate with. So that, that ought to be. But, you know, back to the question that you raised in terms of who will be the prophet, who's going to save the people and all that, it's difficult to say. Because there has to be somebody who's passionate about these things who is integrated and part and parcel of all these things and who really wants to see these things improve and who wants to sacrifice because usually the people that provoke change, that create change, don't benefit from it. And that's one reason why people are reluctant. So there has to be somebody who is selfless enough to want to uh, technically sacrifice for the people and all that. And once you don't have that, you begin to have a lot of um, the fifth columnists in every major issue. And, you know, um, our generation didn't really understand the origin of the fifth columnist. So it's good to see some of the stories that led to it. You know, during the Spanish Civil War, there was a General Valdez, I believe, who was trying to capture Madrid, the city of Madrid. And they asked him how is, um, what were his plans for capturing the city? So he said he had an, a column of army approaching from the north, another column from the south, east, and west. But he said, it is not any of those four columns that he's relying on to take the city. It is the fifth column. So they asked him, where is the fifth column? He said, it's inside the city. So that's the origin of the word fifth columnist. When people are not sincere and straightforward and focused, you now subject the system to a lot of fifth columns. Where is that insincerity coming from? Because it seems that Perhaps what, what exactly is wrong with the PIB is more of political will, more of the political crisis. I remember I had a show um, a day before uh, the hearing happened at the House of Representatives, and I think two days into the one that happened in the Senate. And Honorable Sergio Sogun was my guest, and I asked him exactly the question, what are we going to be expecting the next day? Uh, of the hearing at the house. And he told me categorically clear, yeah, Nancy, we're going to be expecting fireworks. And indeed, when I saw that on TV, I said, oh, this <laughs> is really fireworks. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, we're still expecting the technical secretary, Hoscom, host communities of Nigeria producing oil and gas. We invited him, and let's see if he can still join us uh, during the show. But where I'm going to, really, is that it's more politics that we're seeing, this political infighting. Is it that the sincerity is also not on the part of government and not on the part of the host communities, not on the part of every stakeholder involved? You know, politics in and of itself is neither good or bad. It is the people who play the politics that determine <coughs> whether the politics is good or bad. In other words, the political dimension to issues just take up the nature and the character of the people who are involved in the politics. Now, if the politics is sincere, I mean, if the people are sincere, then the politics involved will be sincere. So the, the issue is not so much as in political will, you know, that exists in a vacuum or in a phantom, but it's the fact that the people who are supposed to 
be the ethos of this political will are just not there when it matters. They, they just don't stand up to be counted. So basically, when people understand that you are available for the cheap, they don't take you serious when the issues are deep. And that really has been part of the issue. Because for every stakeholder, it is believed, it is assumed, and it has even been proven over time that there is a price. Where the things will really matter, people should not have a price. I'm not advocating the perfect man and all that, but there, is, there comes a point where there must be sacrifice. There must be sacrifice to ensure that the things do happen. This generation within the host communities have an excellent opportunity. The bill from what it is, is talking about 2.5% available for them for which they are going to create a host they community. they disagreed with it. Yes. That they disagree with the 2.5%. Even if they disagree, that is the people on the external, where there is a problem is that they are not communicating with those who are representing them because they are for every area within the Niger Delta, there is a representative within the National Assembly. And those people are involved in the debate. The deputy chairman of the PIB is from the Niger Delta. There are a number of other uh, people there who are from the Niger Delta. So there, there is voices. So those, that, those figures didn't just come out of nowhere. There are people that are aware. So they also need to also spend time rather than spending a lot of time abusing everybody and finger what pointing. What percentage do you think is fair? Because they, 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 they are conversing for a 10% equity True. Uh, a stake. True. But now there that is are where the produce. The, that is the, the, where there are also a lot of is, challenges with Nigeria. From. Getting into the percentage that may be fair may be getting into controversial issues, but there are some more important and salient issues that I want to bring. For example, the first set of refineries that were built in Nigeria were not built by Nigerians, and they were not built by Nigerian government per se. The Nigerian government had a deal with Shell that once their production exceeded a certain amount, I mean the exploration exceeded a certain amount, they would build a refinery. And when he hit that amount, they built the refinery. They ran it for a few years and then handed it over to Nigeria because <coughs> in the words of Shell, it was not in their core operations. There is nothing that stops the host communities from developing such plan for development within the communities so that the funds they get does not be monetary funds, but funds for development. That is what I see the host community bill setting up by setting up a development plan. The issue is that there is so much money in terms of cash that has gone within the communities, but it has ended up in places where it can be traced. And they don't want to get to a situation. I mean, in the north, there was the granite pyramids. They used it to build Kaduna. In the southwest, there was the cocoa season. They used it to build cocoa house. There's the oil and gas season. Let there be developmental infrastructures within the Niger Delta that will show if peradventure oil ceases to matter. So do you think it's the Niger Delta people that are inhibiting, that are stopping perhaps the development of, of, the, of the area? Well, they have contributions. How? Because if, if the thinking is that all the fault is outside of the Niger Delta, then the, what you want to do is do an audit of all the amounts that have gone into the Niger Delta and find out what happened to them. It's that some, some things are clear. I may not be in the best position to actually say this is your fault or this is not your fault and all that because a lot of what I say could be misinterpreted. And Perhaps all that. you're in the best position <laughs> as a consultant and so someone that understands that sector and someone that is independent and someone that is not also from that area that may have some biases. Well, so I'm not totally from, from a professional. I mean, my wife is from that area, so I'm not totally. So, so, so your <laughs> wife people shouldn't <laughs> come and take your wife away from you again <laughs> because no, you are not supporting your wife's people. But you understand what I mean. In I, terms I, I of totally, un I totally understand what you are yes. saying. But you see, the the point is that sometimes it's not so much as in the fine details of you are wrong, you are right, and all that. But let us get the building blocks of the principles right. Once the principles are right a lot of things get corrected. And one of the principles that I'm, um, I mean, I have said should come out of this is that a lot of the fund that will be given for host community development should not go in terms of cash, should not even go in terms of, it should go basically in terms of infrastructure development. So you want to 
build um, factories, you want to build high rises, you, you know, there should be things that you can So with this to. kind of thing, now, where, where does it place the NDDC? The same question I asked, was it last week or so, when I had the same topic, before uh, we saw what ensued at the National Assembly. Where does it place the NDDC? Where does it place, of course, the NNPC and some other regulators? Because we're talking about the commercialization of some of these entities. Incidentally, I don't think it affects the NDDC. The NDDC will still run. However, the NNPC, as we know it, will cease to exist for, for a number of reasons. And I think there will be, there'll be, there'll be a regulator, there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be a vehicle for upstream activities and all that. It's all spelled out. And that's important and necessary for greater transparency in the industry. The truth of the matter is that a man with influence and a man with money ought not to also be a regulator. Otherwise, you will have something, I, I don't want to call it a beast, but... So what should it be? But basically, that's what it is. What should it be? A player? If you're exactly. a player... Because the question, you're, you're talking of the NNPC. Yes. Okay, so what should the NNPC be then? The NNPC has a structured has evolved over the years. It's, uh, it's an organization of the circumstances of Nigeria. It is not what the NNPC should be, but it is the, where, um, the kind of organizations that should exist in the industry for the industry to function. In other words, all regulatory influences should be separated from all operational influences. So NNPC through the NPDC is a player. They do exploration, they do everything. But they also have influence where the HQ in determining policy and all those kind of things. If you have Zenit Bank also having some of the powers of CBN, you know that's a recipe for something. That, I mean, and it goes, it's not peculiar to the oil industry, it's peculiar, it's same with any industry. Now, it may sound nice to the person who has the powers, but is it necessarily the best way? to actually develop the industry. Because for now, we have oil, we have uh, labor, we have competence, but we are not attracting funds. And all those things speak to faults and defaults within our framework, within our structure. And those are things ought not to be. Because at the end of the day, <coughs> people who are less familiar with the dysfunction that the system has caused will just look from afar and say that you people are not getting yourself. Yeah, it's true we are not getting ourselves, but it is not so much as in one decision or one lack of decision. It's the fact that there is a system that is not functional, and that dysfunction needs to be removed. Mm. How optimistic are you about this new bill uh, before the National Assembly uh, on a whole lot of issues which we've talked about? Because we're talking about even the host communities are requesting for a 10%, and they did say that after 60 years of discovery of oil at the Loewe you can imagine what exactly is happening in that area. Uh, unlike what we see in other climes, if s sometimes when I look at the issues about Nigeria's economy, just my heart bleeds. And sometimes I even cry in my own secret place because there's a potential to be greater than where we are right now. If you take a look at Norway, what Norway has done with oil, it's a very, it's a stark difference from what we are doing and what we've done over the years. So for the host communities, for example, to say, for every assembly has gradually reduced our equity stake to about 2.5%, and I think from 75 to 5% and all of that, to also how the operators should operate, to also how other stakeholders, to what role the NNPC should be, uh, should have, to all the stakeholders. Are you optimistic that at the end of this administration we would also have it passed, or we may have splits of it like we saw last no, I, th I think <coughs> you are going to have everything. The speaker himself said at the opening of the session that we should look at, I think, April for the passing of it and all that. The truth of the matter is that we are not where we were 12 years ago. We are not as rich, we are not as fluid, and the people are more aware. So everybody who is a major player who is involved understands the need to pass it as different from this is just another law that is within the assembly. So there's basically that understanding. So that nobody really needs to be preached to in terms of this. So from that, you can expect that the bill will be passed, the bill will be passed on time. What is now happening is that the different players, 
the different stakeholders, excuse me, the different stakeholders are trying to get their interest covered in the bill, which is normal and which is legitimate, which is basically the lobbying process of the assembly to, us, to ensure that everybody is taken care of. But what we have not really looked at is post PIB. Mm. After the bill is passed, what's the process for the dismantling of That's it, another NNPC. topic. <laughs> I think we'll look at that on another day. Thank you very much uh, for speaking with us. All right, I've been speaking with Olabo De who is the chief executive of SAT, Capri, also an energy consultant, vice chair, gas to pass study group of Nigeria Gas Association, and SLA to the Senate President and Consultant House Committee on gas. Uh, we expected High Chief Judge Buckner, Technical Secretary, host communities of Nigeria producing oil and gas, uh, but he couldn't uh, join us. All right, that's the much we can take on today's edition of the program. Thank you all for being a part of the show. Please join us again tomorrow uh, where we'll be bringing you another edition. I am Nancy Naji. Be the best you can be. Be the change you want to see. Don't forget to wear a mask. Bye now. Hello YouTubers, welcome to Moneyline with Nancy TV YouTube channel. This is where we provide you with instructive business directions, processes and guidance to help you assess the right resources to fund your businesses to withstand every form of internal and external shock. You will find here awesome informative videos on business, entrepreneurship and lifestyle just to help you make informed business and financial decisions. Punch the subscribe button and let us drive you through the world of business. Please follow all our social media platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn and follow us for latest updates on our website.